British scientists say the scale of a mystery virus in China might be far greater than authorities there have acknowledged. The outbreak began in December in the central city of Wuhan. The infection is a new type of coronavirus which originated in animals. My name is Temba Cosmos, calling from Nigeria. What are the symptoms? It's the first British fatality from the coronavirus. It's official. The coronavirus is here in the UK. Wash your hands from Wash your hands. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. Prime Minister, are you telling people today that sooner or later all of our lives are going to be disrupted somehow? From this evening, I must give the British people a very simple instruction. You must stay at home. The coronavirus newscast from the BBC. Oh, wow, people have stood out on the pavement. People like me that are going to be looking after you when you're at your lowest, just stop it, please. The staff here are dealing with the biggest challenge ever faced by the NHS. It's hard to comprehend how historic these times are when you're living them. Behind the statistics, the government charts, the number crunching, are the lives lost. COVID-19 has reached rural India. Bring oxygen, a woman pleaded. Captain Tom, you're an inspiration to us all, and we thank you. Stay at home, protect the NHS, and save lives. The first vaccine has been developed which appears to prevent 90% of people contracting coronavirus. If I can do it, well, so can you. It's extraordinary how fast the coronavirus story has moved in less than a year and the things which we know now that we didn't know then. Here at BBC News, we've been setting out the vast range of developments in this continuing saga, which has affected all our lives, week by week and day by day throughout 2020, and trying to look ahead to 2021. The new strain of coronavirus was first identified as a potential threat in China at the turn of the year. At the end of January, a student and a relative tested positive for the virus in York, these were the first known cases in the UK. On the same day, the World Health Organization declared a global emergency. By the middle of February, the virus had been given its official name of COVID-19. And at the end of the month, a British man who'd been infected on board the Diamond Princess cruise ship died in Japan. Laura here is a member of NHS staff. She's just going to demonstrate what actually happens. So she stays in the car, she winds It wasn't long window, before we saw for the first time what virus testing involved. One of them has got the full protective equipment on. Her colleague stands back at a safer distance. Erica, the senior nurse, shows information about the procedure. Tilt the head back for me, Laura. And then carries out nasal and throat swabs. They're sent off for testing. They get through 12 tests a day. Few would have predicted then it would need hundreds of thousands of tests daily across the country. The first death from coronavirus in the UK as the number of cases doubles in just 48 hours. That first Covid death in the UK was announced in early March. Within a week, the Prime Minister had this warning. I must level with you, level with the, the British public, um, more families and many more families are going to lose loved ones before their time. In Italy, the scale of the crisis was becoming quickly apparent. 10, 50, 60, 70, until 200 patients in our emergency department. Here, the government and its scientists were still working out a strategy to tackle the virus. To try and reduce the peak, broaden the peak, not to suppress it completely, also, because most people, the vast majority of people, get a mild illness to build up some degree of herd immunity as well so that more people are immune to this disease and we reduce the transmission at the same time we protect those who are most vulnerable from it. 
That phrase, herd immunity, surprised and worried some people. It suggested tolerating a further spread of the virus in the knowledge enough people who got it would become immune, though this was later denied to be an official policy. But then virus experts stepped in with dire warnings. One of them told me in a recent interview what had happened. Even making quite optimistic assumptions, we were estimating there could be a quarter of a million deaths over a one to two year period. As importantly, the NHS would be completely overwhelmed. Um, in the same way as we saw in Northern Italy, for instance, in uh, February, March. And so that really drove the decision making. He thinks the lockdown happened too late, though ministers don't agree. So was the policy too draconian? It was never that we were gung-ho about this as a solution. It was a last resort, really. And I mean, one of the reasons, perhaps, for some of the delays is there was a very clear recognition that this would have costs, both economic costs and human costs, in terms of people's health, you know, well-being, mental health. Um, it's just there wasn't an alternative. As the official strategy was developed, people across the UK were still mixing freely. The virus is deadly here, not Daniel, I'd say. But the virus was now moving fast, and over a few days in March, there was a flurry of official announcements. Avoid pubs, clubs, theatres. Making available an initial £330 billion of guarantees. If we can get this down to numbers 20,000 and below. And then this. From this evening, I must give the British people a very simple instruction. You must stay at home. Less than a fortnight later, the Prime Minister himself was taken to hospital with COVID. He joined thousands of other British people who'd been hit by the virus. I've developed mild symptoms of the coronavirus, that's to say a temperature and a, a persistent cough. And on the advice of the chief medical officer, I've taken a test that has come out positive. But mild symptoms turned into a serious threat to the prime minister's health as he was moved into intensive care at St Thomas's Hospital. It's the sickest patients who go into intensive care, so clearly this is a cause for concern. But the Downing Street statement made clear it was a precaution. He'd been moved to intensive care at St Thomas's should he require ventilation to aid his recovery. That suggests he's not on a mechanical ventilator to help his breathing, which would require sedation. But he will be re requiring oxygen through a mask or nasally. Throughout spring and into summer, my colleagues at BBC News documented a national crisis and the individuals caught up in its path. 30, 90. Fergus Walsh was the first TV reporter inside an intensive care unit. It is completely unimaginable and we're not at the peak yet. This is the front line in a war. Apart from two patients, every patient we're looking after has got COVID. We can't cope with a big spike, we just can't. Every day, some battles are won. Is, is one of the doctors here? And some are lost. All the patients here are critically ill. We're planning for many more patients, so all our theatres to be full of COVID patients and possibly beyond. It is, you know, we've, none of us have ever seen anything like this. The staff here are dealing with the biggest challenge ever faced by the NHS. They can save many of the patients, but sadly, not all of them. And still, more patients keep coming every day. Ed Thomas reported from a hospital in Lanarkshire and the experiences of a wide range of patients, young and old. Suspected COVID-19. <laughs> Look beyond the daily statistics. These are the lives changed forever. And that's you completely breathing on your own. Listen, I'm, I'm a lucky one. I'm seeing my family. I'm seeing my family t tomorrow. <laughs> From those trying to save the sickest. We've had three deaths, which has totally floored the staff today. It's probably the most amount of deaths in one shift that we've had so far. To the eldest, most vulnerable. <laughs> and the youngest. The last thing you want to hear when you pick up the phone is your babies get coronavirus. Mums and dads of babies kept in for observation.
can only visit for an hour a day. What was it like being away from your baby for 15 nights? In sleep. It was so hard. It was so hard. But these babies are never alone. We said 40 a.m., isn't it? 40 a.m. Receiving constant care. What have the nurses and doctors been like here? Honest to God, they have been a treat. They deserve a medal, every one of them. To contain the virus, the maternity ward is now divided. No one's allowed in. It's to isolate coronavirus it's right there. Yeah. Peyton is three weeks old and has the virus. I can't thank them enough for what they've done for her. Are you waking up? She's always watched over. Definitely privileged to have such a great team behind her. She and her own. <laughs> She's have been brilliant. When you got your phone call saying oh. your baby's got coronavirus, that's the worst thing I can only imagine. Um, but you just need to power through and provide the best care we can give at this horrible time. What side do you want to do? Hi, baby. Clive Myrie covered the challenges facing a major London hospital. The front line of the war on coronavirus is everywhere. On the floor of a corridor, on a door handle, in the shake of another's hand. Damoa Asari is proud he's waging war on the virus, a 10-year veteran of the cleaning staff at the Royal London Hospital. All of us cannot be doctors. Somebody has to be a doctor, someone has to be a nurse, and somebody has to be a domestic. So I'm proud of what I'm here. Because altogether, we can better. you're helping to save lives. We have, yeah, we have to. We, we all, all of us come together and then we save more lives. It's a selflessness much admired in this pandemic, those choosing to do what others wouldn't. And so many of the nurses and doctors and consultants, as well as cleaners, the helping hands guiding us through this storm, are black, Asian and minority ethnic. <laughs> Studies suggest those from the BAME community are being affected by the virus disproportionately and are almost twice as likely to die from infection than those who are white. Why is unclear. When it comes to BAME NHS staff, proximity to the virus through close contact with infected patients is a disproportionate feature of many of their roles in the health service. Some argue the NHS needs to examine staff deployment policies for structural racism, where certain workers are retained in lower paid roles. But for most nurses and doctors, white or black, given the correct protection, where else would you want to be if not cushioning a patient's pain? By May, the UK's COVID-19 death rate was one of the highest in Europe. It was becoming clear that in care homes, elderly residents were especially vulnerable. My colleague in Northern Ireland, Emma Vardy, was one of the first to highlight the issue. This is the first time Julie Bennett has seen her father in four weeks. Oh, you can't touch my hand. He doesn't understand why she can't come in. Heartbreaking. Staff at this care home in Belfast have been coping with a number of suspected and confirmed cases of coronavirus. All 82 residents are being kept in isolation, but it's not easy. Many have dementia. He's looking for us, you know, and saying, why is his family not coming to see him? But I know the staff here are so good to him, and I know he's being well cared for. They're afraid to go to work themselves because they probably have vulnerable pe people at home and young children. The first cases of the virus were detected early here. Magdalene Mitchell, a resident, passed away in hospital. Get your phone and take a video. Staff are trying to prevent infection as best they can, but residents need hands-on care and the virus can spread rapidly. Do you worry about your own safety? Yes. Yes, yeah, I do, yeah, every yeah. day. I mean, the PPE is amazing. You know, it really, it really helps us 100% because then we know that we're doing the best we can not to carry anything. Yeah. And you always have a fear in the back of your head. It's hot and tiring. 
but behind the masks still smiles. Inside, residents need them. I love you. God bless you. The smallest interaction means a lot. Love you. The crisis of coronavirus in 2020 also showed people at their best. One man who sought to make a difference and inspire others was Captain Tom Moore, the 100-year-old former British Army officer. Inches to go, and there he is. Congratulations. Well done. His back garden marathon raised more than £30 million for NHS charities. Uh, Captain Tom, how do you feel this morning? Fine, I mean, yes. I mean, I've got, I'm surrounded by the right sort of people, so, uh, yes, I feel fine. I hope you're all feeling fine too. <laughs> For many people up and down the country, the example of Captain Tom and others helped draw us together. The sense of national solidarity was rarely more evident than on 10 successive Thursdays at 8pm with the clap for carers. John Kay reported from one particular street in the West Midlands. On this street, like so many others, it is personal. Sarah, at number 11, is on the front line. She's a healthcare assistant at the Birmingham Hospital Trust that's had more than 600 COVID deaths. Does this help you get through? Yes, massively. 100% helps me. Yeah. Helps me. Every Thursday. Yeah. Every yeah. Thursday. It's like a release when you, when you cry. It's a release, yeah. I mean, I come, I come out and I see all my neighbours out and everything and they're all like clapping. It's another week class to, to come to an end. It's just amazing. It's just fantastic. I just can't believe it. Oh. <sighs> At precisely eight o'clock, for the fifth week in a row, it felt like the whole of the UK erupted. <laughs> 8,000 miles from home, members of the British Antarctic Survey joined in. In the Middle East, Divers from HMS Ledbury clapped and washed their hands at the same time. In the skies above Wiltshire, the pilot of a light aircraft plotted his flight path to spell out his gratitude. While on the ground, the social distancing red arrows. From bin collectors in Norfolk to the royal family. Back in the Midlands, Sarah and her husband Gary, who's a delivery driver, have moved into a caravan on the drive. See you soon, Mum. We love you loads. Thanks for all you do. So they don't put Sarah's mum at risk. Gwen is 83, clapping for her daughter and for thousands of others. And she'll be saying thank you again next week. I'm all right then. Case numbers and hospital admissions began to fall. Lockdown restrictions were eased around the UK. But life was far from easy for those needing non-urgent operations which had been postponed because of COVID pressure on hospitals. And he said, this isn't even up for discussion. You need both hips replaced. Helen had been waiting more than a year for a double hip replacement. I'm in quite a lot of pain. Some days are worse than others. Sometimes I go into a spasm. It's just the not knowing. I don't know whether I should be walking. I don't know whether I should be sitting down, resting. It, it's, it, there's just nobody telling me what, the, what, what I should and shouldn't do and when it might happen. As people returned from summer holidays and pupils went back to school, the testing system came under immense strain. The BBC reported that some people were being told to drive hundreds of miles for a test, including one family near Glasgow. Belfast uh, wasn't exactly desirable, especially with a ferry trip. Um, so I went back in again to try it again, and the second time it tried to send me to Portree in the Isle of Skye, which is a 127 miles and a, a five and a half hour round trip, uh, well, five and a half hours each way. 
a second wave of cases accelerated. Once again, hospitals came under huge pressure, especially in northwest England. We put our feelings to the back of our minds from the last wave um, because it was so stressful. And now that we've got this second wave, you know, it, the anxiety has definitely come back within the staff and within the trust. Stay at home. Three words that brought life to a standstill in spring, now an instruction for Wales in autumn. It's our best chance of regaining control of the virus and avoiding a much longer and much more damaging national lockdown. By now, restrictions were being tightened, though in different ways around the UK, a firebreak in Wales and then a second lockdown in England. Christmas is going to be different this year, perhaps very different, but it's my sincere hope and belief that by taking tough action now, we can allow families across the country to be together. Our objective in taking this action now is to protect the NHS, create the prospect of seeing some loved ones at Christmas and completing the journey to next spring with as few restrictions as possible. The brutal truth was that the virus was continuing to claim lives. I was still thought that it might get better. The shock came when I got a call on the early hours of the Friday morning to say that it developed a complication and that his heart had stopped. And the reason why his heart had stopped was um, a clot on his lung. And um, I knew they did everything they possibly could. <laughs> As 2020 came to an end and looser restrictions were promised over the festive season, the news which had been so keenly anticipated arrived. I just want to bring you some breaking news about COVID vaccine because Pfizer has said that its COVID-19 vaccine has been 90% effective. And then a world first. Ninety-year-old Margaret Keenan receives the Pfizer vaccine at University Hospital Coventry. So, Margaret, first of all, tell us, how was it for you? It, it was fine. It was fine. I wasn't nervous at all. It was really good, yeah. And what do you say to those who might be having second thoughts about having this well, vaccine? I would say go for it. Go for it because it's, it's free and it's the best thing that's ever happened. Vaccines offer a way through the pandemic, but with Christmas not far off, there was bleaker news. The discovery of a new variant of the virus, the promised household mixing over the festive season, was severely curtailed. Scientists revealed the variant of the virus resulting from mutations meant it was growing more rapidly. This virus spreads more easily and therefore more measures are needed to keep it under control we absolutely need to stick to the basics of making sure that we reduce our contacts, reduce the ability for this virus to spread, and that's the reason that tougher measures are required to keep this variant under control. Professor Whitty, if someone is packing a bag right now, listening to or watching this, trying to leave the southeast by midnight tonight, what should they do? My short answer would be, please unpack it at this stage. So looking further ahead, what do the experts think we can expect? I'm hopeful that we'll be able to see some relaxing of social distancing measures by end of March, April time frame, such that we get back to something more like we were the position we were in in, say, early September of 2020, where people could at least visit each other's houses if they were careful. Um, there was more open society than we have now, but not completely normal. Will people have to accept, for example, face coverings and some form of social distancing measures for quite a long time through 2021? Yes, I think some, some form of social distancing, I think masks are going to be with us. It's difficult to predict exactly when, but at least until the autumn of 2021. There have been devastating losses. Lives have been blighted by coronavirus in 2020. The year has come to an end on a sombre note, but there is some hope that 2021 will at least bring more protection from this deadly virus. Yeah.